So this is Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my father promised, for which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your word to us. It is a light for our path. It is food for our soul. Uh, We bless you and thank you that you have spoken to us by your spirit. So as we look ahead to all that is going to be coming up, our Lord, help us to be resting into your word and relying on you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, Well, thank you uh, for being a part of uh, this morning. Um, And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, part of what I'm doing here is I'm preparing the way uh, for the uh, sermon series that's coming up in January and February, where we're going to be looking at Acts. Um, in both churches, we're going to be going through all the book of Acts, and that will take us all the way through to Ash Wednesday and Lent. So having just had Christmas, we're looking ahead to Lent, um, that's, and that's okay. Uh, in fact, um, you realise today that the bishop actually gave us permission to cancel all services because he knew that the numbers would be light. Um, but I also thought it was important to be able to do this um, because we need to take those next steps. And so even on this light day, so we're going to have a light day, and so we're not going to talk about anything particularly heavy. In fact, the only thing I'm going to talk about is the sheer turning point of all of history. And that's what our light topic is going to be. And there's a practical side to it in in terms of preparing uh, for this series, uh, but it's also not without a Christmas theme. Uh, So I remember early on, uh, a number of years ago, there was this TV dramatisation of the Book of Acts called Anno Domini. Does anyone remember that? It was probably the 80s or the 90s. It was actually a really good... I I I was a teenager, I think, when I watched it, but the the dramatisation of Paul's life in particular was really moving, including at the end when he was executed, there was this real sense of faith in it. Um, But... uh, I remember watching it, and at the time, there's something in me when I was a child which would uh, get really uh, annoyed with things that didn't seem symmetrical. I always wondered, why did we have dates set that were BC, before Christ, and then the next bit wasn't AC, after Christ, it was AD? What on earth is that? Right? And, uh, and the point of it, though, is that it actually makes a perfect sense. It's not before Jesus happened, and after Jesus happened, it's before Jesus happened, before Christ. And then Anno Domini, in the year of the Lord. And quite deliberately, that has a present tense about it. It's not like something's happened before, something happens after. Something's happened and now something has changed. We are in the years of the Lord. And surely that's a good way of marking a common era. These years are the Lord's years. 
And as we see in, um, in the introduction to Acts, this is not here is the book about all that people did once Jesus had gone. It was, dear Theophilus, I wrote to you about what Jesus began to do in Luke. And now I'm going to write to you about what he continued to do by the power of his spirit in the years that are the Lord's. And the whole point is that our years, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, even these years are still Anno Domini. They're still the years of the Lord. And our history, personal history, lives in the light of the, of, uh, the history of the one who broke into history and brought light into the darkness. So that's, the, that's what we're going to be grasping as we go forward, is what are these years of the Lord that we're living in? So yeah, the book of Acts begins, and Luke mentions, he, Luke wrote Luke, and then he wrote Acts, and, uh, and then he talks about all that Jesus continues to do. And I don't know uh, what 2022 will bring, and here's the question to be asking ourselves, but as we go into this book, um, there's this baseline assumption that I'm going to be bringing with it. If these are the years of the Lord, then my baseline assumption is that the Lord is actually here and the Lord is with us. This is his year. We are his church. Our lives are his lives. Our homes are his homes. Our hands and our voices and our time and our money and all those other things are all dominee. They are all of the Lord. And so like every other year in this year that's coming up, as churches, both the parishes and the congregations and the various things within them, as individuals, as families and households, we're going to be finding ourselves caught up into a call to live our lives for Jesus in a way that lines up with the calls and the vocations that we see in Acts. And that's what we're about. In fact, if you want to say, what is a church? Well, we are the collective of those who live our lives for Jesus. We deny ourselves. We submit ourselves to his way. We say, your will be done, Lord. And in losing ourselves in that way, paradoxically, we are brought into the trueness of who we are because we are made in his image by the power of his spirit. And like every other year, this year coming up won't be easy. We'll get tired, we'll be weary, and we will discover there's ways in which we are disobedient to the way of Christ, where there'll be a hardness of heart in us, and uh, we'll have to deal with our compromises, perhaps. Uh, we'll have the dangers that we all normally fa face. We may slip into nostalgia rather than into obedience. We may beat against the sky and yell at God saying, don't do it like this, I don't like it like this, Lord. And in, with and around all those difficulties, what we'll find, just as the people in Acts find, is that there will be grace, grace and more grace. And there will even be some victories and breakthroughs and miracles. And if there's any miracle, the one I'm praying for, for myself, if nothing else, is that the spirit of Jesus will awaken our hearts that we may thirst for him and yearn for him and get to know him more uh, during this year. That is my prayer. And if there's something that's going to challenge us, then I think it will be um, something that's akin to what Peter says in his sermon on, on uh, Pentecost Day. As the people of God saw what was happening and said, what does this mean? Uh, Peter said to them, at the end, he says, what this means is you must save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Do not be like the world. Don't value God's grace cheaply. So we're going to see, for me then, Acts is a very applicable book to the year that's coming up. And so I'm going to encourage not just everyone in this room and not just anyone who everyone's on the live stream right now, but whoever is uh, taking the time to uh, listen to this introductory sermon, read the book of Acts over the next few weeks. Um, it's actually quite an easy read. It's full of narrative and story and excitement. It's the stuff that you would make a, 
a movie from with Peter Jackson as the director. Like, it's, it's a good book. Um, have a read. But as we do that, three big themes, and uh, I just want to go through those quickly. The first theme we're going to be seeing is this. In Acts, the people of God have a mission. And the mission is nothing short of remaking all of human society in union with God, our maker. The mission of Acts is to see a new humanity of worship and God's life emerge. I hope I haven't oversold that. <laughs> that is the mission. And one of the reasons why we need to name that up is because um, that is our mission. And it's that, our, that's our mission before it is anything else. So when I talk about the words mission, uh, different activities and things will spring to mind. But before it is things like making converts and growing our numbers, it's about forming a new society around the worship and life of God. It involves making converts and growing in numbers, but it rests on that deeper mission. Before it is about being socially active and bringing about justice, it is about forming a new community around worship and the life of God. Before it is about running a decent organisation and having PCCs and joint councils and all the rest of it, it's about forming a new community around worship and the life of God. And in fact, the danger is if we put all those sorts of programmes and activities first, we miss the deeper mission. Our mission is to be a seed crystal for human society that is growing around worship and the true knowledge of God. And only Jesus can do that in our midst. So when Jesus commissions his friends, he simply says to them, you will be my witnesses. He doesn't say, go and run this program. He says, you will be my witnesses. At this point, he doesn't even tell them, no, you will be evangelists or you will be prophetic activists. All of that sort of sense of what giftings he gives us and all that sort of detail comes later. At the beginning, he simply says, you will be my witnesses. And what are they witnessing to? And you can see this time and time again as you go through Acts. In fact, one of the interesting things about Acts is if you read it and go to all the points where there's, where there's a sermon, where there's a talk, where they, these are the meant to be the ones who are preaching the gospel first. And, and you read it, and my first, when I first did this, my initial reaction was, but, but they're getting it wrong. Right? Because when you read it, there is no cliched Billy Graham, here's the cross paving over the chasm to get you to Jesus. That, that, that's not what they preach. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. What they simply do is they bear witness they say, this Jesus who you killed is the author of life. This Jesus God raised up and has inaugurated a kingdom based around his lordship. Will you join him and be citizens of that kingdom? This Jesus whom God raised up has been appointed to be judge of the earth and he's coming again. They simply bore witness to what they knew and they bore witness to a resurrected Jesus because they were trying to establish a community of resurrection people. People of the resurrection of those who have died to themselves and now live for Jesus. They're a community that is oriented towards the eternal, raised from the dead, uh, dead to sin, fruit of the spirit way of being community together. That's their mission. And in there, in that mission, is the good news of forgiveness. It's of it's the, it's the understanding of the effects of cross of Christ. It's about the trembling heart of God for justice and goodness. But, and, and there is, but the mission begins with this fundamental conversion, not just of our inner lives and not just of our outer individual priorities, but of our collective culture together. It gets reoriented towards living an eternal life that starts now to live in the year of the Lord, if that makes sense. So that's the theme that we'll see draw out. 
The second point is this, that as God's people do this, they do this reliant on the Holy Spirit. Um, there was uh, someone who spoke recently at the 24-7 prayer gathering. Her name was Daniel, Danielle Strickland, and, and uh, Jill put up a tweet of hers. It was a quote. It's just from Facebook. And she says this, and she talks about the mission of God. She says, Lots of religious people are great with power and the possibility of heaven later. It's the kingdom coming now that's problematic for a lot of people. Because the kingdom coming now is like a power confrontation. And I think sometimes we think if we are winsome enough, if we do it the right way, if we're kind while we do it, if we're smart about it, then there won't be any problems when it comes to the proclamation of Jesus or the demonstration of the way of Jesus in today's world. We think we can do that and it will be okay. But what happens is that Jesus gives the disciples power, Holy Spirit power, a specific type of power. And it's not about dominance, control or sovereignty. Jesus gives the power of the Spirit to heal, serve, uplift, that gives you the capacity to resist and to stand in solidarity. It's a subversive power. I like that. And one of the things you realise is as, they, as you, if you go through Acts, you'll see how the people of God devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. And they didn't do it because it was a nice thing to do. They did it because they absolutely needed to. Without God's word feeding them, without that encouragement to each other to keep on keeping on, then it all falls apart. They rely on the Spirit of God. They push towards a goal, but not in their own strength. They want to see God's kingdom come on earth as in heaven. And so they lean um, not into themselves, although they will draw on the skills they have. Paul uh, leans into his training as a Pharisee all the time. But most of the time, they are winging it. Most of the time, they are just trusting God with one heart and one vision and one mind, and they gather together to hear God's Spirit speak to them so they can go, Lord, how do we do it? And as I think about that for ourselves, as a benefice in particular, um, well, we've got a lot planned for 2022. We've got new benefice structures. We've got recruitment for new children and families workers. We've got mission opportunities in schools and all sorts of things. And it might even, if we get to the end of this year, it might even look good. We might even look back and go, gee, we've done well. But part of me says, if that happens, we'll have done it wrong. Because when you look at Acts, yes, they pushed ahead of all manner of good things. And at the end of the time, they look back on a period of reliance on the Holy Spirit. And the only thing they can say is, oh, wow, look what God did with us. And it doesn't become about them and what they build up. And so even Jesus, in some sense, he does say, go, he says, get on with it. But his first instruction is actually, wait. Wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to strengthen you. And so my exhortation, brothers and sisters, is that in 2022, that not only will be, it will be a year of mission forming a new community, but it will be a year of waiting on the Spirit together. The first two big themes. And the third point is just quick, and, it goes, and it's this. God does it. it. This isn't just some mild theory where we go, oh, that sounds like a good idea. God fills his people with purpose and achieves it. The shape of Acts has a progression. You will be my witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There are going to be lots of maps in this series. And you will see how basically it's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth is a geographical progression. And as Acts progresses, we see it. On the day of Pentecost, it starts in Jerusalem. By the end of the book, Paul is in the known centre of of the universe. 
And when I used to talk about Acts in Tasmania, I used to say, and here we are at the ends of the earth and the gospel has come. In fact, and I hope this is true, point of trivia, if you take, go from Jerusalem and you dig a hole down through the centre of the world and come out the other side, the nearest city to where you come out is Christchurch, New Zealand. How is that? That literally the ends of the earth from Jerusalem is a city named Christchurch. A silliness, but I like that sort of thing. But the point is, God does it. He moves his people, sometimes through adversity, sometimes with divine guidance, and he makes it happen. So my prayer is not only, Lord, make us this subversive community that, that is reshapes society around worship and life. Not only is it, Lord, help us to wait upon your spirit, it's, Lord, make it happen. And to that end, I want to be finish my little introductory talk here with a prayer that I've been praying all Advent and, uh, and I've been praying, had a commitment that I pray every day of Advent. My commitment has now ended, but I'm continue, going to continue to pray uh, because this is a prayer that I'm hoping we can all join in with. So if we can put that on the... Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, I wonder if we can pray together this prayer. Glory to you, O God. King of the universe, we give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, whose name we bear and to whom we belong. You have led us to this time and place. We give you thanks for all that you have given us. Save us now from the weariness of our own self-reliance. Fill us with your Spirit that we may know you better. Open the eyes of our heart that we may see you and adore you. Enliven our imagination that we may long for that which only you can do. Awaken us that we might know your presence and truly be the living and active body of Christ. Made one with Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen.